If you are not muted, please mute your mic. And if you have a question, you can either put it in the group chat or you can just raise your hand and we can, um, and we can uh, get it to John. So before we get started, I just have two quick announcements. Uh, one, I want, just wanted to remind everybody about the upcoming webinar dates that we have. Uh, next month, we are really excited to have um, two of our students uh, speak. We're gonna have Joan and Catherine talk on the abstracts that they just had accepted for the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine Congress. And then in April, we are going to have a FEMA representative who is going to come talk about some of the different FEMA programs that are available um, if for people that are looking for full-time or part-time opportunities and give an overview of some of the things that FEMA is involved in. And secondly, I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Langrich because he has um, some information for everyone. So take it away. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, this is Gene Langridge. Happy to be on tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing from John. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, people were aware of the National Preparedness Summit. Summit. It's March 26th to 29th in St. Louis, Missouri. This is always really one of the big events in public health preparedness uh, for the country. Uh, and I'm really pleased to say that Dr. Nina Gannon, who um, really leads most of the sessions of uh, PHP 594, so most everybody has her for their capstone uh, um, project, but she will be there at the meeting and she's gonna be presenting an abstract on graduate student training in public health preparedness at Penn State University. So what she's done nicely is gone through the back uh, past number of years and, and looked at what students have done as a part of their capstone. And she's gonna be presenting a, um, a summary of that information. So uh, we will be talking more about that as it gets closer uh, and seeing if we can't organize a Penn State meetup when, um, during the meeting, but uh, did wanna give a shout out to Nina for her presentation. She'll be there and presenting on the, uh, the preparedness program here at Penn State. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jean. Okay, so I am going to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, John Thaler is a police officer in, in a department in Maryland. He has been in law enforcement for over 25 years. He started his career in Pennsylvania and then went out west as a park police officer before he came back east. He is a state certified enhanced instructor and during his career he's been a field training officer, firearms instructor, an ECD instructor, and a canine handler. He has received several awards from state and local organizations, including his agency's second highest award five times. In 2009, he was his agency's nominee for the American, Leg American Legion's Officer of the Year. He has initiated and developed his agency's wellness program following his own personal struggles, and it is one of the most comprehensive, comprehensive initiatives in the state. He has presented at the Concerns of Police Survivors Office, Officer Wellness and Trauma National Conference, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund Destination uh, Zero National Conference, as well as multiple conferences for Blue Help, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to mental wellness and suicide prevention within the law enforcement community. He's also a member of his county police peer support team, as well as a member of the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. He also serves our country as a military reservist, which is actually how I met him. He and I were stationed together in Baltimore a few years ago. And since 2011, he's participated in the Police Unity Tour, which honors officers killed in the line of duty. For the past three years of the tour, John has dedicated it to police officers who have committed suicide in an ongoing effort to raise awareness, compel action, and honor their service. John, thank you so much for being here tonight, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. All right, great. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Jean. I appreciate both of you for having given me the opportunity to be able to speak to you and your crew there, and uh, thanks to Penn State University for this. So we're gonna get started. We're gonna talk about wellness for first responders. What's going on and what are we doing about it out there in the field? So as Jen mentioned, this is me. Um, 
what I want to highlight about is the uh, police unity tour. I'm pretty proud of riding in this event. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a multi-day uh, charitable bike ride that covers several hundred miles and it encompasses about 2,000 law enforcement officers or survivors and honors police officers killed in the line of duty. But for the past three years, and this will be the fourth year that I do this, I've dedicated my ride to honoring police officers that have committed suicide. Uh, it's an ongoing effort to try to raise awareness and compel action by governments and outside agencies to, to really take a hard look at what's going on for mental wellness for our first responders. And quite frankly, to honor their service because they gave no less of themselves during the time that they served. And as it's engraved on the memorial in DC, it's not how they died, it's how they lived. So if anybody's interested in any more information on that, I'll be more than happy to share about that. So what's going on? What is the problem out there? What's happening to our first responders? Well, according to the federal agency, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, it's estimated that about 30% of first responders develop behavioral conditions such as depression and post-traumatic stress. And this is compared to less than 20% in the general population. I've had many friends of mine that are both, have served both in the military and as a police officer and deployed overseas. And they will tell you unquestionably that being a police officer and a first responder is more difficult than the deployment overseas. About a year or so ago, the Rudderman Family Foundation, which is a nonpartisan strategic group that works with government, private sectors, and philanthropic organizations, uh, published a report that estimates that first responders are affected by post-traumatic stress at a rate of five times higher than civilians. The point here being that we clearly, as first responders, are feeling the effects of the repeated traumas and traumatic events and stress and anxiety that we deal with every day when we go and handle somebody else's crisis. What exactly is happening? Why are some of us walking to that edge of that cliff and even some of them falling off of it, taking their own lives? So according to a 2014 study by the U.S. National Library of Medicine, the repeated exposure to traumatic and stressful events leads to post-traumatic stress and other cognitive defects in first responders. The study investigated whether or not there were hidden effects of consistent trauma, and specifically that these repeated traumas and traumatic exposures may affect different behavioral cognitive and brain related functions and structures that are not sufficiently defined by the standard measures of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms and diagnosis. The results indicated that first responders in fact most likely sustained other physiological injuries and that police officers and firefighters respond distinctly differently to their repeated trauma exposures. In other words, police officers and firefighters, I know I'm repeating myself here, experience can be on the same call for service, but experience the events two different ways. Firefighters are generally the first on scene of say a motor vehicle accident or fire or some other traumatic event that involves them. And when I talk about firefighters, I talk and include EMS professionals, EMTs, paramedics, Whereas police come in sometimes later on uh, in that same call. And what this study found is that firefighters struggled to learn that a previously negative context is later associated with a positive outcome, whereas law enforcement showed impairment in reversing the outcome of a negative cue. 
And after learning that a specific cue is associated with a negative outcome, they couldn't learn later that it's associated with a positive outcome. As you can clearly see by these images, there are effects to the brain. So what are some of the organizations that are out there that are trying to address this issue and bring it to the forefront? As Jennifer mentioned in my bio, um, I've done a couple of presentations for Blue Help. Uh, Blue Help is a nonprofit organization, relatively new, as you can see, established in 2015. That's based in Massachusetts, whose mission is to reduce mental health stigma within the law enforcement community through education, to advocate for benefits of those suffering from post-traumatic stress, and to acknowledge the service and sacrifice of law enforcement officers who were lost to suicide. They also assist officers in their search for healing. They have a project called First Alliance. You can get on this website and it's an interactive questionnaire that can then point you to resources that are available in your specific location anywhere in the country. Their bottom line is they wanna bring awareness to suicide and mental health issues. As you can see in 2018 and in 2017, 160 law enforcement officers committed suicide. And as of today's date, 19 more have taken their own lives this year. Well, if we compare that to line of duty deaths, which gets understandably a lot of attention, line of duty deaths are those deaths that you mostly see in the news, the police officer that was shot and killed, he was in, involved in a mo motor vehicle accident, uh, can be even a heart attack. Training accident. accident. Um, so as of today's date, according to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, 15 officers have been killed in the line of duty. So the trend is there are more police officers taking their own lives that are being killed in the line of duty. But sadly, police officers are not alone in that struggle. The FBHA, the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, is a nonprofit started in 2011, whose mission is to collaborate, develop, and implement behavioral health awareness, prevention, intervention and post-crisis strategies to provide firefighters, again, including EMT professionals, with an easily accessible and confidential source of information. They estimate that approximately 40% of firefighter suicides are reported, only 40%. And in 2017, their last year for publishing figures, 103 firefighters took their own lives. But if we take the 40% and say that only 40% are reported, and that with that 103, then the actual number may be well above 250, approaching 260 firefighters, EMS professionals are taking their own lives. And using that 2017 number, if we extrapolate, what it is to date, a firefighter commits suicide once every three and a half days, we can estimate that there's 10 that have already taken their own lives. Compare that to the U.S. Fire Administration's statistics, and the U.S. Fire Administration is part of FEMA. Two firefighters have been killed in the line of duty this year. So government and professional organizations are beginning to recognize and address the issues of mental health and suicide prevention within the first responder professional communities. For those that are not familiar with the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, this is a pretty large professional organization. They published a long anticipated report as you can see, entitled Breaking the Silence in 2014. 
and that brought suicide prevention within the law enforcement community to a national level. It's been reported that only three to 5% of law enforcement agencies within the United States have suicide prevention programs. So if you know that there are over or approximately 800,000 law enforcement officers in the country, and we use that three to 5%, that may be anywhere between 35 to 40,000 only for 35 to 40,000 have access to a suicide prevention program. The report did, however, provide critical guidance on how to address mental health issues for law enforcement. And in 2018, January of that year, about a year ago now, President Trump signed the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Act, which made grants available to initiate peer support programs. So there's a movement afoot. It's like turning the Titanic. There's a slow roll, but it's better late than never. These are some of the organizations out there that are able to provide help, small, localized organizations that are trying to push this agenda on a nationwide level and try to become a part of this movement. Blue Help, as I mentioned, started in 2015 as a result of the rising suicide crisis within law enforcement. There's FBHA, which, as I mentioned, began in 2011 and addresses mental health issues with firefighters and EMS professionals. Serve and Protect is a nonprofit with a faith-based foundation. They're located out of Tennessee, and they help facilitate healing. They target active and retired first responders and their families. And most of these organizations out there include families. They utilize former professionals, and they open all of their services up to loved ones and family members. Code 4 Northwest, as you can probably guess, is located in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Washington State, and is run by an all-volunteer group and started by a Seattle police officer. Code Green was started in 2014 by EMS professionals, and what I like about what they do is they actually collect stories online through their website, and they publish them anonymously. And it serves a couple of purposes. It serves as an outlet for those that provide those stories as, a well, as well as a way to show them that they're not alone. And that's pretty key in any type of mental crisis that somebody's going through. Inevitably, as I know personally, when I went through mine, um, you feel completely isolated and alone. And the reality is that's, that's not the case, but you still, your brain still goes there. So I like the fact that Code Green provides that service. Safe Call Now is uh, another one out of the Pacific Northwest and provides a 24-7 confidential hotline for first responders. They just uh, received the contract for the state of Maryland last year to serve as their um, peer support hotline. And Code 9 Project uh, produced a full-length film about this. Uh, about suicide and mental health and the effects of post-traumatic stress on police officers when one of their founders, who was a spouse of a New York State trooper, uh, he had to retire after the effects of PTSD. But it's, it's still a struggle. There's a, a tremendous stigma out there with all first responder professions. When I bring up COPS, if anybody's familiar with COPS, Concerns of Police Survivors, it's a fantastic organization. Uh, they're well established. They started back in 1984, and they were created to help survivors of the traditional, quote unquote, line of duty deaths. Uh, they created this organization so they could rebuild their lives. And they've since become a leading advocacy group for law enforcement. Started in 1984, in 2016, 
they held their first national conference on wellness and trauma. And while this, the group still focuses on line of duty deaths, it took this tremendous organization over 30 years to join the conversation that discusses suicide. And now they have a very popular and very well attended uh, training that's supported by the US Department of Justice called Traumas of Law Enforcement. Uh, I've been there, I've attended it, and it's probably one of the most fantastic trainings I've ever been to. But the point is, even with this group that serves as an advocacy for survivors and those that have suffered, it still took a long time for them to throw their hat in the ring. So let's just look at for a moment, specifically, what are some of these things that are creating these issues? I'm just gonna talk about one department and one shift. As Jennifer mentioned in the uh, beginning, I do work for a department outside of Washington, D.C. Um, the United States Department of Justice would consider it a, a mid-sized department. So this one shift is my shift. We'll just talk about some of the things that my shift experienced um, during a, a very short period of time to show you how easily it is that first responders can be affected and how this mental wellness and suicide crisis takes over first responder professions. So on October 12th of 2014, Amanda Boyer, a retired deputy sheriff in Montgomery County, shot and killed herself at her home in front of her husband, who was also a retired law enforcement officer. Uh, my shift drew the short straw and responded and was the first on scene. I'd worked personally with Deputy Boyer many, many times during my career. She was a consummate professional. She was very helpful, uh, always willing to do more than what was necessary. And uh, in 2016, as I had, had mentioned before, I, riding in the uh, police unity tour, I rode in honor of Amanda. Little over a year later, um, December 10th, 2015, police officer Noah Liata was returning to his patrol vehicle after making contact with the driver of a vehicle he had just stopped. Dead center of that screen is Officer Liata's patrol cruiser. The Chevy Suburban in front of that cruiser is the vehicle that he stopped. As he was walking back from talking to the driver, he was struck by another motor vehicle, which is the front vehicle that you can see half of. It's a Honda CRV or something. He was struck and thrown approximately 25 feet from the impact. And uh, luckily enough, my shift responded and I was the second car there. Uh, I can recall very vividly to this day, walking up and seeing Noah's body on the, the uh, roadway, uh, noticing his eyes and how the life was leaving him. I stood there for a moment, I yelled to my partner to, to grab the med kit uh, to at least do something. It was pretty chaotic, but I still had to do my job. And part of my job was moving on to the striking driver. He remained on scene. I conducted the DUI investigation and ended up arresting him. Officer Liata died a week later after spending all of that time on life support. And at his funeral service, I served on my department's honor guard to honor Noah and lay him to rest. And 13 months after that, on the 7th of January, 2017, a police officer's cruiser was struck by another intoxicated driver almost directly across the street from where Officer Liotta was struck and killed. If you look up at the top left and see this white sign alongside the roadway, maybe one of those for sale or for lease signs for a property, that is where 
Officer Viata was struck. And again, my shift responded. And again, we were the first on scene. And again, I conducted the DUI investigation and arrested the driver. The struck officer uh, survived, but he was seriously injured and out of work for an extended period of time. Uh, I think it goes without saying that following these incidents, my shift mates and I were very affected by these three events. And some of us ended up needing outside help in order to be able to process what was going on. During this time, I began reading and studying a lot about mental health issues within the law enforcement community. And I first came across the term cumulative career traumatic stress or CCTS after reading research conducted by Dr. Ellen Marshall. Dr. Marshall study was conducted on officers from police agencies within the state of Delaware. And her findings were published in the Journal of Police and Criminal Psychology and referenced a questionnaire that she had developed and used with those officers. I just, I tracked her down as a nice way of putting it. And I reached out to her and inquired about the questionnaire and asked her if I could get a copy of it. My intent was to use it on my own officers within my own department so that I could get an idea as to the extent of mental health issues with my coworkers. And the results were, were shocking for a, a mid-sized agency that had not experienced a line of duty death or an officer involved shooting in many years. They were shocking. And so here are some of those numbers. 80% of respondents have trouble sleeping. They're either having trouble falling asleep or they're having trouble staying asleep. 80% experience reoccurring images or thoughts of a distressing event. And 80% have difficulty concentrating. May come as no surprise to some, but 75% used alcohol to relax. 70% experience flashbacks of an incident and 70% say stress from the job has affected their relationship with family members and loved ones. 55% say they experience nightmares as a result of an incident. And 40% have physical reactions of an event after being reminded of another, with another 40% having experienced intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Now, I know that's kind of, for me, it was kind of hard to wrap my head around that. I mean, we're talking police officers. These are the guys that come through your door when you call 911 to be able to help you with your crisis. And 40%, almost half, are experiencing some level of fear, helplessness, or horror. But the lowest numbers that we received were the most startling and shocking for me. 25%, one out of every four of the guys that I work with, thought a line of duty death would be better than suicide. And an additional 25%, so that's separate from the 25%, so it's 50% total, thought about suicide straight up. And for me, that was simply unacceptable. I just couldn't let that go. So I went to work because I don't like just not doing something about that. The first thing I did was I crafted a memo to the chief of police. And there you can see it because I had to share with him what the police officers, what the first responders, those public servants, the most important aspect of his department were feeling and experiencing. And so I proposed a wellness initiative and he gave me the go ahead but I didn't have any money whatsoever, and I had no clue how to get this project moving forward. I just knew I had to. So I networked, I talked to civic groups, I created partnerships, and I got creative with incentives and ideas. And to date, since that initial memo, you can see what my agency's wellness program is made of. Some of the things that I'll, I'll highlight 
I've worked with this. Some of you may have heard of the Rand Corporation, which is a, a pretty significant think tank that does a lot of contract work for the government. And I talked to a suicide prevention specialist there, and he said one of the best things that you could do is identify people within your provider network. Now, I utilize the employee assistance program, which I'm sure most employers have, or I hope so. But identified people who could relate to the first responders, the police officers, the firefighters, the EMS, and they called them public safety specialists. He said that was huge to be able to just identify them so they could find a connection. Um, another big milestone was the state certified in service training to be able to show things in black and white to these guys to to say, listen, this is how your brain is going to work and your body's going to react to stress no matter what, no matter how big and tough you think you are, this is how it's going to happen. And break it down on that in black and white really won some people over. And then some crisis cards. These are, these are things that I developed on my own. And on the one side, it has 24-7 hotlines that anybody can call at any time. They're created out of like uh, credit card plastic. And on the other side, it has three very simple coping skills that you can employ in the moment. You're having a crisis, you are just got done with a officer-involved shooting or some other critical incident, and there are three very easy things that you can do. Each of the officers have this, and they can easily put it in their uniform pocket and pull it out whenever necessary. And I encapsulated everything in a website and that's the website down there i encourage you to visit it it's not just for my department there's only one page out of the whole thing that's dedicated to the department because of resource uh, and employer specific stuff but everything else is available to everybody and what it does is it creates a safe and confidential place where an officer can just pull it up on his phone, they can pull it up on their mobile data computers inside their cruiser, in a parking lot somewhere, anytime during the day, any day of the shift, and be able to know that they're, they can do this in privacy without having anybody really aware of it, but they can still reach out and get help. And that's the most important thing. So I needed to be able to ensure that we were doing the right thing. And with any program, you need to be able to measure success. You need to know that you're heading in the right direction and on the right track. And so three months after that initial in-service training, I solicited feedback via an online survey. Again, I had no money. So it was a free survey, 10 questions. And as you can see, there was a lot of positive response, overwhelming positive response to that training. And that's the point. We want to bring awareness to be able to educate people into movement. Is it enough? See, we're still getting knocked down. First responders are still having a hard time. That number still pops up. 263, according to 2017 numbers, are still committing suicide, so we have to do more. So I started riding in the police unit tour because I was tired of going to funerals and saying I needed to do more. So I rode in the unity tour in order to try to bring awareness to what was going on to police officers out there. And as was mentioned before, um, these last several years, this will be my fourth year that I'm doing it to raise awareness about suicide and mental health within the police community. But that was still not enough for me. So in December of this past year, I started my own LLC because those that help others need help. And I wanted to help my brothers and sisters in arm. Now, like many other small groups out there, like some of the ones I talked about, Blue Help, Code 4, Safe Call Now, they all offer training. Uh, and of course, customized training is the way to go. You want to identify the agency's need and cover important elements of it. But unlike the others, I'm a, I'm a man of action. I like to see results. And so one of the other things that our LLC does is we'll create a wellness program for your agency. We'll go in, we'll do some networking, create partnerships, 
and we'll go in and give you a baseline program that you can immediately turn over and hand to your troops and say, here's what we got, and you can hit the pavement running. Additionally, that website, very critical as far as I'm concerned with being able to provide first responders with a way to get help and get it quickly, safely, and confidentially. A website serves as a critical porter, portal for that program and its resources and information. And it's all available for family members and loved ones as well. So there are still some next steps. There's still some things that need to be done. With only three to 5% of law enforcement agencies out there having a suicide prevention program, we need to keep working. We have to break that stigma. For all first responders, it's killing us. It's crushing people's will to get help. This is Christina Splain, and although I never met her personally, I've met her parents many times over the past few years. Christina was struggling with some personal issues when she called her mom and said, Mom, you got to get over here. Those were the last words that she spoke. She shot herself. Yet you'd never know it by reading the newspaper or by talking to the agency's public information officer. She, quote, died suddenly. Now I get it, right? It's a double-edged sword for public service departments. You have to be able to trust them. Do you want that firefighter, that EMT, or that police officer coming through your door and knowing that they may have their own mental health issue. But the reality is, the truth is, is that some of us do. And so we have to be able to make that commitment to our people first. Uh, I'm a big fan of this quote. I use it a lot in my presentations and stuff because it's so true. I like to think it's what I did. I simply had a green light to make something happen, but no real tangible support to get it done. Yeah, go ahead and do it, get it done. And so I started where I was. I used what I had and I did what I could, like any one of us out there can do. Those of you that are in government agencies, yes, been there, done that, some restrictions, but it's possible. It's possible to make movement outside organizations can help break that stigma, be understanding, offer resources. The bottom line is we need to help and take care of each other. We just, we have to. Our first responders respond to others, crises in critical moments every single day. And people inside and out of these professions need to help those that help others. That's it. That's all I got. Of course, I will be happy to answer any questions. There's contact information for me. Um, please check out the website. Email me if you can have any questions, want any information. If you can think about anything later and it pops up in your brain, I'm here. The end. Thank you so much, John. This was. Um, I mean, when we were stationed in Baltimore together and we started talking about this, you really opened my eyes because it wasn't a problem that I had realized was this, was this large and this serious. And ever since we had those first few conversations, I've taken a whole other look at, at seeing what police officers go through. And I've got friends who are officers and there are some times when, you know, I'll be having a conversation with them and I'll just let them talk because I look at it so much differently after after having talked to you and knowing that these resources are out there are are great and my brother is a corrections officer as I've said yep. many times with different students that I have who are in the uh, corrections field and a few years ago uh, one of my brother's fellow corrections officers killed himself and my brother's jail did not have any of the any sort of wellness program any sort of resources and i went to john and said you know what could i give him to i wasn't so much worried about my brother um 
but I knew that some of the officers that he worked with were really struggling. So it was, it was good to know that these programs are out there and hopefully through the work that you're doing, um, they will, there, there will be more of them. So um, can open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions right now? <laughs> Jill, I just saw that you unmuted your mic. Um, do you have a question? Because I didn't hear you. Oh, gosh. I mean, I have a ton of questions. <laughs> Would love to just hold some discussion on this. So I'm, I'm just trying to narrow it down to one question. Um, I, you know, maybe the biggest thing is I'm, I'm a police wife of 22 years. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. 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 Well, and I mean, yeah, thank me, but thank him, you know, he's the one out there doing this well, crazy work. And, and it's just so hard because of the mindset of most police officers, like to approach them and, and make them know this is important. I mean, they know it deep down, but it's hard for them to ask for help, you know, and it's when you want to help, but you don't know how to help people because of the way their personalities and their mindsets are. It's, it's hard to know where to start. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, listen, uh, one of the things that I, I did in the wellness program with my agency as well, as well as I um, produced and distributed a, a family booklet. And it basically was like a, an introduction into mental wellness issues, mental health issues, um, mm -hmm. what's available for you as a family member, uh, the recognition, the signs and symptoms of those issues, what resources are available for you? It was because sometimes, well, first of all, family members are, are a critical link in the wellness and healing of any one of us first responders. Mm -hmm. And they often get overlooked, unfortunately. And so the point was to try to address that, but also give you some direction, like point you at least into an area where you can feel confident and say, okay, I'm not completely in the blind. I know how to at least help him somewhat because I can see what's going on. Because awareness and education is huge. But um, I think that's what I pride myself on with the website is being able to have it so these officers on their own space and time can reach out and at least if they're not going through a crisis, at least inquire or investigate or look into some of these issues so they're more aware and being able to identify if something does arise with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I'll definitely check out the websites. I'm also the president of a local um, police family support group, Central PA Thin Blue Line Families. Um, we're a small nonprofit started just, you know, a couple years ago as some police wives getting together to socialize. And oh. now we've, you know, we've gotten a little more, um, gotten a couple years under our belt and some more experience in what we actually want to do. And we're really trying to keep it focused on the police officers. You know, we don't want to do a lot of like fill the cruiser events and, you know, community stuff while that's important and that's great. Like this is what we think is important. And so often in a lot of the police wife groups and events that I see, there's a great response when a tragedy happens, which yeah. is awesome. But as you said, there's all these other officers, officers out there suffering silently. Yeah you know, and that, like, we need to do more, like you said. Um, so, and, and it's, it's hard too. We, we do with, um, my husband's police department is a fairly small department, you know, 10 officers. Um, and you know, you deal with some of this, the small town politics and stuff like that. And you just feel powerless. Um, yeah. as the officer, the officers feel powerless. And of course the families do too, cause you don't know how to help. Um, so I really appreciate you. I, you know, having this um, talk and I'm definitely going to reach out to, I, you know, I was sitting here taking notes like I'm in college again on a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff you gave. So I appreciate it. Well, good. Of course. Yeah. Like I said, reach out. If any of those questions you want to just fire away in an email, please do. Okay. Yeah. Jill, did you have another question or are you? Um, I don't think so. Okay, so. it looks like, uh, Jean, you have your hand up? 
Um, yeah, I do. Uh, John, thank you for the presentation. It was really, really good. Very good. Um, thank you. And like, um, like Jen, it opened my eyes to things that had been hidden before. So I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I guess as an epidemiologist, we get into the, we get trapped into looking at numbers all the time. And while you gave me numbers that satisfied that part of yeah. my life, um, <laughs> you also made it really very real with individual people. Um, so I'm, there are a lot of things going through my mind here, like Jill said. Um, so I guess, um, you know, a couple of questions that come to my mind. So, um, you know, there are suicide prevention lines um, that we have. Um, I guess, can you speak a little bit about to those, the utility of those for this particular group? Uh, and, um, and, you know, are they equipped to deal with the sort of things that you're talking about? They are. They're all the suicide prevention lines that I'll call them the generalized ones are, are good in their own right. And, but what you will find, and I'm sure those of us that are not only neck deep in the, any first responder profession, police officer, firefighter, whatever, but those family members as well, I'm sure Jill would agree with this to a certain extent. Um, I'll speak specifically about police. I don't like right or wrong to talk to non-police officers because I'll get frustrated about the inability, not on their, not, not in a bad way, not purposefully or consciously on their own part, but to be able to connect with me. And, and I think that's so critical for people within these professions to be able to have somebody that they can relate to and then trust when they're exposing themselves because this stigma is really crushing us and literally killing us. And so if I'm going to open up to somebody and that person on the other end doesn't necessarily understand the, the nuances of my job, I'm more likely to shut down quicker. So there's a lot of these organizations that I put up there on one of the slides that use retired professionals from the uh, communities that they try to deal with, firefighters, EMS, or police officers, because they recognize that that's the best way to get them to talk. I yeah, I, I, I agree. I think police officers are very skeptical to open up to anyone that does not understand the job and has walked in their shoes. Absolutely, 100%. And it's not, it, again, it's not it's not intentional. It's right. You're, you're, my job as a police officer is to walk into a crisis situation, however minor it might seem, but it's somebody has decided to call 911. And so it's, it's reached that level and to be skeptical and to be inquisitive and to be on guard about everything. So then you're going to ask me to talk about my own feelings and about my suicidal thoughts. And I need to be very specific as to who, I do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was my phone that went off. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'm also thinking back to sort of a personal or um, knowledge of a personal situation. So back when we lived in Hershey, um, one of the pastors from our church who had been a police officer in New York but then it moved to Hershey. Was also had a uh, was also a lawyer too. Um, I guess I just don't know much of the, many of the details. But he left the the church to, and now he is a uh, counselor mm. in one of the Harrisburg area. Um, I think he's associated with the police department, at least first responders. So I know that you know he is uh, kind of a uh, his. I think his position is part time. But he's there as a, as a uh, uh, what do I want to say, a counselor, a confidant, whatever, to uh, first responders. Um, so you know, we, after your presentation, that makes me really even more appreciate the role that he plays for oh, that particular community. 
Yeah, absolutely. A lot of departments, uh, including uh, the one I work for, have uh, chaplains. You know, they're mostly volunteer that uh, do ride-alongs randomly and uh, are there just for that, just for that outlet to be able to, uh, you know, help guide someone that needs some help or just be that ear at that particular moment. And they're, right. they, they're very important. Yeah. 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 Great. This has been very, very helpful. I, I'll, I'll stop right now and see if other people have questions or comments. Um, but you've really caused a lot of things to, for me to think about here, oh, uh, particularly in our program and, um, you know, making sure that we are uh, just trying to think about how best we're going to incorporate this information, this perspective into our curriculum here. Great. I'm here. Reach out. I'll be able, I'll be more than willing to help. Yeah, I get that sense and you already have. So thank you. <laughs> I don't see any other hands up? I guess one quick question that I have for you. I know when you went to your chief and you had the memo, you had a lot of, of numbers to back it up and to show in black and white the severity of the problem. And it seemed like they were pretty supportive letting you go and, and start this. Do you think that other departments that don't have it um, do you think maybe if they were presented with data like that, it would it would change? Or do you think maybe it's just a different mindset from different people? Well, so a couple of things. I, I, I talked about how um, one of the aspects of the in-service training that we put on, one of the biggest sells and, and quite frankly, positive feedback that I got back was the fact that uh, we had a mental health professional say, I don't care how big and bad a you are or how tough you think you are, whatever, your brain is going to react this way, black and white when it comes to stress, et cetera, et cetera. And my point is that's the way many police officers, most police officers work in, in a very black and white type of thing. If you either broke the law, or you didn't break, break the law. Right. But for me personally, Knowing how well entrenched this stigma is within our profession, I felt there's no way there's going to be any movement if I can't show something that there's some tangible hard numbers. And that's me as well. But I was, so I needed those numbers in order to make any movement whatsoever. And when I got those numbers back, I was overwhelmed at how how shocking and startling they were. So my, my point is, I think you're always going to have naysayers, like even during one of the in-service training. Now, when I, the, the response rate for that survey, that questionnaire was 33%. Now, me not being the scientist or anything like that, I thought, oh my God, that's horribly low. I can't even believe that only one out of every three people responded to the survey. But the, the doctor's that I reached out to said, oh, that's a fantastic response rate. So I don't know, it is what it is. But um, somebody said, well, you only had three, one out of three people respond when I was talking about how 25% of the respondents thought about suicide. So there's always gonna be somebody out there that is gonna naysay it and try to shoot it down or derail it or whatever. And so by presenting the hard numbers, I think you handle both those scenarios, the people that need those numbers and the people that are always going to be skeptical no matter what. Now, they're, they'll still be skeptical probably at the end of the day, but at least they won't have much to talk about. Does that answer your question? It does. I, I know when I've talked to some officers that I know, about things that they've gone through. Like I was talking to a friend of mine and he was telling me that he had just, um, he had just responded to a call where there was a baby that he was giving CPR to and the baby didn't make it. And I said like, oh my God, are you okay? You know, were you able to at least take a walk after? And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, no, he's like, they don't care. He's like 15 minutes after I put the baby down, I was in a fight with a drunk guy. 
Yeah. So, you know, I, like I said, after hearing, after hearing everything that you've said and talking to you about this and then looking at everything differently, I, really really see the important how important this is and i'm really glad that you were able to come talk tonight and help oh, thank you so i don't see any other hands up so unless anybody has any last minute questions which it doesn't look like <laughs> i will say thank you again um we are going to get this recording up and we'll share the link with our students who weren't able to be here tonight um, so thank you very much, John. We really appreciate this. This was a great presentation. Absolutely. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you, John. It was really was good. And Jen for setting this up. You're welcome. And again, reminder, next month, we're going to have two of our students. It's going to be March um, 6th, I believe. I have a calendar right in front of me. Um, yeah, March 6th at 8 o'clock, and we will be sending out the, the link and the flyer, but you just pencil that date in, and we will see everybody next month. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.